and welcome to what is going to be the first real episode of Inform Seminar. My name is Neil Gorman, your host. Thank you very much for downloading this and listening to it. I appreciate that. So this is the very first quote unquote real episode of this podcast because in the two previous episodes, what I did is just kind of tried to set the stage and give uh, an idea of what it is that I plan to do and hopefully will succeed in doing. And in the episode today, we're actually going to get started. We're going to start talking about the very first chapter or session, if you prefer, of Lacan's Seminar 11, The Four Fundamental Concepts of Psychoanalysis. Keeping in mind that this seminar was spoken by Lacan, it was not him sitting down to write this out loud. He he spoke this to a audience of people in Paris on the 15th of January, 1964. So when I read the seminar this time, when I read, well, I didn't read the whole thing. When I read this chapter of the seminar this time, uh, it was kind of interesting to me because I was looking at the highlights that were in my text and I was looking at the different mo- uh, moats. That's not a word. I was looking at my notes in the margin and the notes were clearly taken on two different readings. And as I look at this, as I look at the highlights and and these notes, it's really clear to me that the other two times that I've read this seminar, the things that stood out to me are not the same things that stand out to me this time, my third go through of this thing. Uh, The first time I read it, I was a lot younger than I am now. I really didn't know a a bunch about the whole W-H-O-L-E of Lacan's teaching. I, this is one of the first I think this was the first, actually, seminar of Lacan's that I got and tried to read. And, you know, I was I was lost at the time that I did that. I was trying to make sense of Lacan and failing a whole bunch. You know, I tried to read the Acree and that didn't work very well for me. And then people told me, yeah, don't really start with the Acree, start with the seminar. Seminar 11 is a really good one to start with. And so I did, but even with that, I mean, I, I was still really muddling around trying to figure things out. And I think what I was trying to do is maybe just impose too much uh, logic and sense on this thing. As I said in the previous two episodes of this podcast, you know, this the seminar is a spoken thing. Lacan was talking when he gave the seminar. It wasn't something that he wrote out every single word of and then came and read to an audience. Uh, he, he talked, he was making it up as he went along and he was, he had a lot going on. I mean, he would talk about something that he'd kind of switch gears and talk about an, another thing, then go back to the first thing, then go back to the second thing, then go to the a third thing, a fourth thing, back to the first. He was bouncing around a lot. There's tons of different things going on in these seminars that, that might've made it sound perhaps more disorganized than it really is. But the point I want to make here, I guess, is the first time I read this, I just didn't appreciate the fact that this was not something that a person sat down and wrote. Because when you write something, you're always editing it. You know, you're you're rewriting things, you're making things make more sense, you're developing a very usually logical and sequential sort of gradual thought and argument that, that unfolds hopefully logically and sensically throughout the course of the text. And, and that's what I was looking for here. And that's not what I found. And I, I think I just got really, really confused because I was trying to follow everything that was going on, which I don't think you can do when you read a seminar of Lacan. So that, that was kind of interesting seeing that. Uh, the second time that I read this thing, I had a, a better sense probably. I'd, I'd been working with Lacan for a couple of years at that point, and I had a better idea about you know the way all these different concepts in Lacanian psychoanalysis. And I had maybe a kind of decent map in my head of how they were connected to one another not all of them, but some of them certainly. And so the second reading seems like I got more out of it. So hopefully this third reading, I'll get even more out of it as I go through it this third time. Uh, yeah, something else I wanted to say with this. Oh yeah, here it is. I actually have it written down on a post-it note here so I don't forget. I've said this before, but it, it's so important to me. I'm going to say it again. What I'm offering you in this podcast is not any kind of a definitive reading of this seminar. I, I am not capable of doing that. I am not somebody who I think has a strong enough grasp on Lacan to offer anything that would be like a definitive reading of anything that he did. 
but I've been working with Lacan for a while now. And I do think that I have something that might be useful or at the very least interesting to people. And I'm going to offer that. I'm going to give you a reading, my reading, the reading of this seminar that I can do right here, right now. But that's what I'm doing. Okay. So that's enough rambling kind of preliminary remarks, don't you think? I sure do. Let's go ahead and dive into the text here. So here's my overview. I'm going to be talking about five things that stood out to me as I read this text this time. Those things are the fundamentals of psychoanalysis. Another way to describe what the fundamentals are is they are what ground psychoanalysis. They are the base of what is a psychoanalytic practice. The next thing is psychoanalysis as a praxis. Uh, praxis being the combination of theory and doing things, action in, in the world. So my idea here is that theory is sort of a compass that can be used to help a person navigate, but it is very important to remember that a compass and theory are tools that can be used to do things uh, on their own. Who cares what about them? They're tools that are important because they enable people, psychoanalysts and analysands, I think, to act in the world. They're, they're not that valuable, just kind of like on their own. And I'll say more about that in a moment. The third thing is on the difference between psychoanalytic training and formation. And a lot of that is going to come down to the way that desire is approached in these two different things. It's approached differently in training and formation, or at least that's what I'll argue. Then the last, the fifth thing is to remind everybody that psychoanalysis for Lacan is a clinical practice. It is something that is was created by Freud with the clinic in mind, and it is used by Lacan also with the clinic in mind. So those are my five things. The fundamentals, psychoanalysis as a praxis, training and formation, and, and the impact of desire on those things, and psychoanalysis is a clinical practice. Having said all of that, I'm going to do a little bit of transition music, and then we will be jumping in to the first point. So let's start off with the fundamentals. There are two quotes that I want to call your attention to. The first one is on page number two of the text, and the second one is on page number six. Let's get started with the first one. Ladies and gentlemen, in this lecture, I shall be talking to you about the fundamentals of psychoanalysis. That's actually on page one, but then when you flip and you go to page two, Lacan continues, all of this concerns the base of my teaching. Moving forward a couple of pages to six. I ask the question, what are the fundamentals in the broadest sense of the term of psychoanalysis, which amounts to saying what grounds it as a practice? So in these quotes, here, I'm going to actually just read them all the way through without giving you the page numbers. Ladies and gentlemen, in this lecture, I shall be talking to you about the fundamentals of psychoanalysis. All this concerns the base of my teaching. I ask the question, what are the fundamentals? in the broad sense of the term, of psychoanalysis, which amounts to saying what grounds it as a practice. So in these quotes, there are a few things that stand out to me, and I want to call your attention to them. The first thing is that Lacan is making a claim that there are certain things that are fundamental, ultra-important to psychoanalysis. Without, I think the implication is that without these things, you really can't have psychoanalysis. Uh, these are the things that you got to understand sort of first that you've got to maybe not understand, but you have to have enough of an understanding before you can move up and start getting into some of the really complicated stuff. You got to understand these things first. That's reinforced when Lacan refers to these fundamentals as the base of his teaching. The implication there, I think, for people who are really interested in Lacan, and there's people inside and outside of psychoanalysis as a clinical practice who are interested in Lacan, is that if you want to understand what Lacan's doing, you you can't get to some of the really, I guess, high level stuff like the synthome and there is no other of the other and the Borromean clinic. 
all that other stuff, which is really great and super cool, you're not going to be able to understand that unless there is some kind of an understanding of these fundamentals, of this basic stuff that Lacan is going to be covering in this seminar. Then he says that this is also what ground psychoanalysis as a, and I have italicized this word in my notes, as a practice. I'm going to return to this throughout this episode of the podcast. For Lacan, psychoanalysis is not just theory. It is a practice. And when I say practice, what does that mean? Well, it means it's something that people do. It is a action. It is a lived experience that people live. All right. It, and I think that this is important to, to highlight here. And I, and I want to highlight it in this podcast because I am a practicing analyst. And I think that there are a lot of people who I know who are really, really smart people who are not practicing psychoanalysts and who are trying to understand Lacanian theory, but they're, they're not really, I think, really trying to understand it as a practice very often. I think a lot of times they're trying, they're, they're divorcing the theory from the practice. And in my mind, I think that's a mistake. And I think that what Lacan says here illustrates to me that he would agree with that, that he thinks that psychoanalysis is a practice and if you want to understand the practice, you got to start with basic fundamental things. So that's the first claim that I want to make. That's what stood out to me in this reading. So the second th claim that I want to make is something about something called psychoanalytic praxis. If you haven't heard the word praxis before, uh, I remember the first time I saw that word was when I was in graduate school. I had never seen it before that. I didn't know what it was. I looked it up. And praxis is a combination of theory and practice. Now, there's other definitions, but that's the one that I'm going to use here. It's taking theory and practice and putting them together. So I'm going to be really interested in the idea that psychoanalysis is a praxis here. So Lacan says, I am, in the present circumstances, still asking what is psychoanalysis. He says that on page three. To me, this is really interesting and very cool. I love that Lacan says this. I think it is just great that here you have Jacques Lacan, a guy who is somebody who has been giving a seminar on psychoanalysis for 10 years, a decade before giving this seminar. So he's been teaching this stuff for 10 years and he's done a whole bunch of other things besides just teaching it. He's gone through an analysis. He has been reading, he's been writing things that got, that eventually make up the Accree in 19... 66, I think that gets published, so it hasn't been published quite yet at the time of this seminar. It's coming up. He's done a ton of work around what is psychoanalysis. And what he's saying here is that even after doing all of that work, he's not sure what it is. He's not sure what psychoanalysis is. It's still an open question for him. And, and the fact that he is not saying psychoanalysis is ABC thing, that he doesn't define it, that he doesn't put boundaries on it. I think that that's great. Uh, it reminds me of a, a different psychoanalytic thinker, not Lacan here. I'm going to jump uh, from Paris briefly here over to England. There was an object relations theorist over in England named Bion. And one of the things that I like about Bion's thought is that he says that one of the things that can kind of screw people up is having an answer. Uh, to elaborate on that a bit, Bion, I think, suggests, and I'm paraphrasing here, that when people have answers, they stop being curious. Because why would you be curious? You have your answer. And coming back to this quote here from Lacan, I am, at, in the present circumstances, still asking what is psychoanalysis. Lacan is saying that he hasn't decided what psychoanalysis is, that he's still trying to work that out for himself. That means, I think, that he's still really curious about what psychoanalysis is. And I think that that's the, an essential position for anybody. Uh, somebody who's interested in psychoanalysis only as theory. And definitely people who are interested in psychoanalysis as a clinical practice. I think it's really important to have this kind of mindset, to, to be asking ourselves all the time, what is psychoanalysis? As opposed to having the mindset of, I know what psychoanalysis is, it's blah, blah, blah. I, that that latter knowing not so good not knowing being curious being interested in having lots of questions awesome that is i think the preferable state of mind to be in 
whenever it is that you're trying to understand, read, or engage in psychoanalysis in any way. So anyways, a little bit after that quote from page three, uh, Lacan goes on to say that psychoanalysis is a praxis. What is a praxis? In the broadest term, to designate a concerted human action, whatever it may be, which places man, a psychoanalyst, in a position to treat the real through the symbolic. The fact that in doing so, he encounters the imaginary to a greater or lesser degree is only of secondary importance here. That's from page six. There's a lot in this, and I don't think I'm going to actually unpack every single bit of it here, but I'm going to unpack a couple of things that I I think are pretty important here. So again, Lacan says, what is a praxis? He brings that up. And what I think he's getting at here is not just what is a praxis in general, but what is a psychoanalytic praxis in particular. He then says it is in the broadest term to designate a concerted human action. So this is important. He's saying that it is a human action, that praxis requires action, not just sitting and reading and thinking, but like doing things, acting in some way. That is part of what makes something not just a theory, but turns it from theory into praxis. Uh, And then he says that in psychoanalytic praxis, somebody is in the position to treat the real by or or through the symbolic. Uh, What is the real? That is a huge question, by the way, that I don't have time to answer here. But I think Lacan is saying that the real is something that is in our lives. And although the real, and, and he wasn't thinking of it probably quite this way at this moment, eventually Lacan will talk about the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real a lot more kind of in the last part of his teachings. He's thinking about it throughout, but the way he thinks about it changes. I'm getting down a cul-de-sac here. I'm sorry. I guess the important thing I want to say here is that the symbolic is speech. And that Lacan is saying here that a psychoanalytic praxis is treating something that is real, but treating it through or with speech. So an analysand will come and they will talk, they will produce speech, an analyst will listen to them speak, they will listen to their speech, and occasionally the analyst might say something back to the analysand. And it is through speech that psychoanalysis takes place and that the operation, the thing that is uh, a psychoanalytic experience happens. I think that this is important, again, and this is a partisan point of view, I realize, because you can't get a psychoanalytic experience by only reading psychoanalysis. That's not going to work. Uh, you might get something out of doing that. I think a lot of people do. Just by reading psychoanalysis, you can learn lots of things, and reading it can create um, different sorts of uh, emotional and cognitive kinds of experiences that have real effects. So, So it's not like reading psychoanalysis on its own is valueless or that it can't do anything. It has a ton of value and it can do things. Be that as it may, the psychoanalytic praxis is something that can only be experienced, I think, by an analysand coming to an analyst and trying to get the a psychoanalytic experience. I think that's what's going on here. So to kind of close up this point here, psychoanalytic praxis, and I've been saying this already, so I'm probably being a broken record here, I'm probably beating a dead horse, but I'm gonna do it anyways, is that psychoanalysis can't only be approached as a body of theory. It has to be a pro, I mean, you, of course you can approach it that way, but for it to be a psychoanalytic praxis, it has to be approached as not just theory, but also as action, the action of speaking and listening and then responding. That's how it's got to be. So the third point that stood out to me as I read this the third time is this idea about formation or training of psychoanalysts. So to start off with, Lacan doesn't say this. This is me kind of giving you an editorial. This is my ideas here. So I want to tell you about the dis- a distinction that exists in my head when I think about this, and that distinction is present when I'm reading this. It's the distinction between training, psychoanalytic training, and psychoanalytic formation. So psychoanalytic training is the kind of stuff that I think you would see at IPA style institutes. Training is something which has a curriculum. So it kind of goes like this. You, you start here, you do these courses, you read these texts, these books, 
you come to these classes, which last for this length of time, you know, you talk about things, maybe you write some papers for grades, blah, blah, blah. You start a training analysis with a approved training analyst and you sometimes it's also called that a didactic analysis. You, you do that, you do supervision. All of that would constitute psychoanalytic training. What I want to highlight about that is that that kind of analytic formation is based on standards and rules. It basically says to be an analyst, you have to do XYZ thing in XYZ order. And if you do these things, then you can become an analyst. This is the kind of model I think that Lacan had a beef with. He didn't like that. He thought that you can't standardize psychoanalytic training. It doesn't work because every single person who wants to be an analyst, who who presents themselves with the desire to become an analyst, every single one of those people presents differently. They have different experiences some people have lived longer. Some people have lived shorter lives. Some people have read a lot of philosophy. Other people might come to psychoanalysis from something like physics or literature. Who knows? But the idea that you could say, here's the training model that we can apply to every single person who wants to be an analyst, Lacan thinks that's just bunk. You can't do that. Every single person is one off. Everybody is one by one. Everybody is the one and only instance of who they are that will ever be in the history of the universe. So you can't apply a really strict kind of regimented training model. I think that Lacan favors what he would call psychoanalytic formation. And there are people who disagree with me on this, by the way. I want to be really clear about that, uh, that maybe Lacan would not have used the word formation. I'm going to use it here, though, because it, it works for me, I think, right now. So the difference between psychoanalytic training, which I just described in psychoanalytic formation, is this. When somebody goes through a psychoanalytic formation, that formation is theirs and theirs alone. Nobody else ever goes through the same kind of psychoanalytic formation that you do if you want to be an analyst or that I'm going through as I become an analyst, the analyst that I am. Formation is idiosyncratic. It is unique. And... It, it, you can have a psychoanalytic formation where you are very serious and very rigorous and you read a lot of stuff and you go through your own analysis and you get supervision. All that can be present. But the idea that that experience can be standardized is the, the sticking point. That's the thing that I think Lacan disagrees with. And he thinks that, that we have to recognize that even if a person goes through a psychoanalytic training program, and they, they successfully completed, I'm putting air quotes around successfully complete, but you can't see that because this is a podcast. Uh, so say they successfully complete a training program. That doesn't really matter, according to Lacan. It just it signifies that they've passed a program, that they've gone through something, but it doesn't mean that they will be a good analyst. It doesn't mean that they have confidence in their own psychoanalytic ability. It just means that they've completed something in a certain order. Psychoanalytic formation which is different and, and kind of always ongoing, never ending, is something that can't be standardized, which isn't to say that it's it can't be serious or that it can't be rigorous. It can be both of those things. It just can't be standardized. So anyways, that's like I said, that's sort of my idea here. You can file that away under junk if you don't like it or if you think there's something to it, you can put it in your not junk pile. Let's jump into the text. On page nine of this chapter... Lacan says that he wants to focus on what a training analysis seeks. And he says this very specifically. It seeks to answer a question, what is the analyst's desire? Now, when Lacan says this, uh, I don't know if he's talking about the kind of training analysis of an IPA or if he's talking about really any kind of analytic formation. That's still kind of unclear to me at this point. But if I had to guess, I would say that Lacan is saying that some people come to psychoanalysis because they just need help with something. They, they're having some kind of problem in their life. They're not interested in becoming analysts themselves. They just want a psychoanalytic experience to, I don't know, potentially help them with whatever they're going through. That's one group of people. But there's another group of people, a smaller group, that comes to psychoanalysis. And part of the reason that they're coming is that they want to become an analyst. They have a desire to be an analyst. 
And for that group of people, for the people who want a psychoanalytic experience and also want to one day become analysts, the question of what is their desire is a very important thing. So on page nine, Lacan says, what must there be in the analyst's desire for it to operate in a correct way? Question mark. Again, Lacan's really good with questions here. Notice that I'm in this particular reading of this seminar, there's a lot of times where I'm finding questions that Lacan is asking, and that's the stuff that's standing out to me more so than the answers that Lacan gives. I think that Lacan is usually very interested in questions. I think that he's less interested in answers. And I might be wrong about that, but that's the way that I'm thinking about this and, and reading it this time through. Jumping back into the text here, uh, Lacan says that a training analysis, meaning the kind of analysis that somebody gets when they also want to be an analyst, has no other purpose than to bring the analyst to the point that I designate in my algebra as the analyst's desire. This is a really big point, and I kind of want to try to say something about it. I don't know if what I have to say will be useful or interesting or even correct, but this is what comes to my mind when I read this stuff now. When people who want to be psychoanalysts come to psychoanalysis, they have this desire. They, they want to be an analyst and they have other desires too, but that's one of the desires they have. And I think that one of the things that happens in the experience is that a person enters a psychoanalysis and they have a transference to their analyst. What I mean by that is that the transference is a kind of fantasy. It's a fantasy that this person, this analyst, has the capacity to give me whatever it is that I need in order to transform myself into an analyst. And that's my desire, to get this psychoanalyst who I'm coming to as an analyst and to give me what I want. I, that's, that's what people show up with. And then they go through the psychoanalytic process. And as they go through that, different things happen. But I think one of the things that happens is the sort of um, ridiculousness of the transference becomes revealed. And the idea is that this person, the psychoanalyst who you've come to, actually doesn't have what you're looking for. They don't have like some sort of magic wand in their desk drawer they can pull out and sort of like point it at you and zap. And now you've been designated an analyst, go for it. Uh, that's not the point here. And uh, what happens, I think, in a lot of analyses of people who want to become psychoanalysts is they start to confront the question, why do they want to be an analyst? Now, the answer to that question is going to be different for different people. I really can't tell you if you're one of these folks who wants to be an analyst one day, I can't tell you why it is that you might want to be an analyst, but there is an answer to that question. Why do you, whoever you are, have a desire to be an analyst? You know, that that's a really important question. And a, a training analysis or a psychoanalysis of a person who wants to one day be an analyst is going to really kind of focus on that in some way, shape, or form throughout the analysis. So that's the, the point that I want to make here. And one day I might listen back to this and I might think, oh my gosh, what was I saying? That was so stupid. I can't believe I thought that. I've certainly had that happen <laughs> in other times where I've, I've looked back at my notes and thought, gosh, that was so wrong. Uh, and I might think that with this one day, but right now that's what I'm thinking for better or for worse. Well, let's move on to point number four. All of this has to do with the clinical practice of psychoanalysis. Throughout this chapter, I think there is this really important claim being made, sometimes implicitly, but I also think that Lacan makes it explicitly as well, that, well, psychoanalysis is obviously a body of theory. It's words and books and stuff. It wasn't created to be that. There are some things that were simply created just to, to be more theoretical, I suppose, um, but psychoanalysis was, was created by Freud, and it was created to be a clinical practice, to be something that was acted out between somebody who suffers and a person who they come to to help them out with that suffering. So Lacan says, analysis is not a matter of discovering in a patient's particular case the differential feature of the theory, and in doing so, believing that one is explaining why someone's daughter is silent. 
The point at issue is to get her to speak. Analysis consists precisely in getting her to speak. After saying that, Lacan talks about how an understanding of psychoanalytic theory is absolutely useful in this endeavor, in the endeavor of trying to take uh, someone who has someone's daughter who's unable to speak and trying to, to get her to speak. He thinks that theory will help you do that. But he's also saying that psychoanalysis is the application of the theory to some kind of difficulty that a person, a speaking subject, is having. So it's not like psychoanalytic theory is dumb or unimportant. It, it is. It's really important. It's important to read theory and try to understand it. Uh, that's a really good idea to do that. But the reason it's important is because if you read it and you understand it, then you can use it. That's the point. The point isn't just to understand it and that's it. You're done. The point is to understand it and then use it. And I think that that's a really, really key point that gets made here. So the last point that I want to make, point number five here, is the thing that Lacan says very near the end of the text. And before I talk about this, I want to bounce right back up to the first point that I made. You know, Lacan said that there were these fundamentals of psychoanalysis that form a base. They're what grounds psychoanalysis as a, a praxis, a combination of theory and practice. And you, you really need to understand what these fundamentals are if you're going to kind of progress up in your understanding of psychoanalysis as either a theory or as a clinical practice. And here Lacan says what those four fundamental concepts are. Uh, what conceptual status must we give to the four of the terms introduced by Freud as fundamental concepts, namely the unconscious, repetition, the transference, and the drive. So what Lacan is saying there is that those four things are the things that he's going to be really diving into and really trying to say something about throughout the course of this seminar. The unconscious, repetition, transference, and the drive. That's what he's going to be getting into. So that's what stood out to me when I read this chapter this time. I shared it with you. I hope, again, that there was something interesting or useful in that for you. I do appreciate that you've taken the time to download and listen to this this far. I'm assuming if you made it this far that you didn't think it sucked. Thanks for that too. Uh, so again, my name is Neil, Neil Gorman, and this is the Inform Seminar. Thank you very much for listening to it. Till next time, please, please, please make some glorious mistakes. Take care.